what causes transformers to prematurely age? And there's really three things that we can do to slow this aging process down. Transformers in today's world are, um, are a lot of money. They're the most expensive piece in the, in the substage. So they're not, you know, the easiest thing, or they're one of the easiest things to take care of. You know, we do an oil sample on a transformer probably annually, send it off to a lab, and we verify, you know, what's going on with the transformer. If, uh, you know, that's the cheapest and easiest thing to do with a transformer, an energized transformer, it might not be the most accurate or the best thing, the best thing we can do is electrical testing, of course, but what do we have to do with that? We have to de-energize the transformer, isolate it, and do all that. So not everybody can do, just shut down a transformer whenever they want to and do something like that. So there's three things we really want to take care of on the transformer. With this in mind, what I want you to really take away from this is what causes the oil in the transformer to oxidize? That oil was put in the transformer for a reason. Back in the late 1880s, there was a chemist that was brought into our into the uh, electrical industry, and it was he was looked at, brought in to just do figure out what we could do to um, disperse the heat from the winding of the transformer. And he actually looked at vegetable oil, corn oil. Well, what can we get today? Vegetable oil, FR3, for our transformers. But I want you to understand what causes this oxidize, or the oil to oxidize, um, what tests we can look at to determine what, um, how our transformer's aging, or you know, what, we, what it's telling us. And then also uh, how we can slow that process down and then, of course, also, you know, what we can do once our transformers get to a stage of, you know, once the damage is done to the solid insulation in the transformer, there's not a whole lot we can do once we lose that capability. The oil, we can rejuvenate over and over and over, recycle, basically, by doing oil maintenance, oil, you know, things like a dehydration, gas, and whatever that might be. So what we really want you know, to understand is once the transformer, if it does, if we let it get bad enough, what we can do to bring that back to life or bring it back to a good, reliable piece of equipment. So like I said, the four functions of the insulating oil, why that oil was put in the transformer, one was to uh, provide cooling. That was the original thing that we thought of. To, was the most important thing to disperse that heat out of those transformers. But over the years and over time, we get smarter and we understand more along the lines of how things age and what goes on with it. It was also in there, we needed something to provide a dielectric. Oil has been around for since the late 1880s. We've been using that in transformers. It's very good, it's reliable, and it's cheap. So we continue to use it. 90% of the transformers in the United States are oil-filled. Now that number is slowly decreasing as transformers age and are older and fail and are being replaced with, a lot of companies are replacing everything with alternative fluids, the FR3, uh, things like that. So, but, uh, out of these four, then the night, real nice thing about it is we can pull an oil sample on it. It's a testing medium. We can look at it, determine uh, you know how the transformer is aging, if it's gassing, uh, you know moisture content in the transformer, things like that. But out of those three things, there, what do you think is the most important today? We thought years ago in the late 1800s, early 1900s, is that it was the cooling, but today. The most important thing for that oil to do is to protect that solid insulation. Like I said, we can rejuvenate the oil, we can bring that back to life, but once there's damage done to the paper, we have two options. Rewind it, replace it. That's basically it. So we remove the oxygen. There's not a lot of free breathing transformers in the United States. 
But if you do have one, you're, you're looking at about 30,000 parts per million of oxygen. Now, if you have about 30 parts per million of oxygen, 30,000 parts per million of oxygen, and 65,000 parts per million of nitrogen, and your transformer is not meant to be a free breathing transformer, guess what you got? You got a free breathing transformer. Someplace on that transformer, there's a leak. If you don't see oil, it's probably if it's top mounted bushings, top inspection plates, something along those lines. So you might want to do a little bit of a pressure test on it to determine you know, where that leak is. Degassed or sealed with a nitrogen blanket. A lot of the industrials uh, live in that world. You guys pretty much live in this world right here. Vacuum filled transformer with a nitrogen system or a conservator tank. Do we all know what a conservator tank is? just to keep a positive pressure on the transformer. Transformer oil, when it heats up, expands, cools down, it contracts. That's how we get our pressures in our vacuums. Um, and of course, we don't want to pull an oil sample when we got a vacuum on a transformer because it's just going to suck bubbles and air into it. But this is where we usually live right here. The vacuum filled transformers of the industrial or the utilities out there live in that world right there. So how does the new oil age? Oxygen. How do we keep oxygen out of a transformer? The easiest thing is to go out there and do a visual inspection on it. It's cheap, it's easy. You know, you look at the transformer, you determine, okay, there's no leaks on this transformer. I got a positive pressure. You got a good sealed transformer. Now, just if you go to that transformer, and it's at zero on your pressure vacuum gauge, you don't have a nitrogen blanket or a conservator tank on it, just because it's at zero doesn't necessarily mean it's got a leak. You might have just hit it at that right time. So come back a little bit later in the day when the ambient's heated up a lot, load might have heated up or increased a little bit on it, things like that. But there were studies that have been done. You look at these, these are the exact same oil, but this one had oxygen bubbled into it. Which would we rather have in our transformers? Hopefully everybody says the one on the right. It's nice, clean, crisp, clear oil. Now I'm not saying if you pull a sample on a transformer and it looks like that, that it's gonna be bad. That's why we do oil testing. So where, do the, where does the oxygen and transformer come from? 90% of it comes from leaks. That's, and that's the easiest thing. So if we just take care of those leaks, that takes care of more than half of our problem. But if we get our transformers up to too hot of um, oil temp or top oil temperature, the paper and the oil are going to start giving off oxygen. Because the paper is, it's dried, it's put in an oven when the transformer is manufactured. But they have, the manufacturer has 24 hours to take it from the oven and seal it in a transformer. So you get a little bit more oxygen or atmosphere back into the paper when it's manufactured. Heat, you get a top oil temperature up around 70 degrees C, your paper is gonna degrade automatically no matter what you do. No matter how clean the oil is, no matter how dirty the oil is. 70 degrees C top oil temperature should be avoided at all costs, okay? Actually, like I said, if we can keep it down around 55 degrees, somewhere around there, you should be pretty happy with what you see on the aging of that transform. And again, like I said, 70 degrees C, it's gonna generate significant oxygen just from the paper and the oil that's in there as it ages. Heat, we have a 10C rule, or what we call a 10C rule. For every 10 degrees C, here, let me show you this. We're going to take an acid number, which is the first test we look at to determine the aging or how the transformer is aging. It's in the oil screen test or liquid screen test. We're going to take this number right here, this or the line right here, this uh, 0.25 neutralization number. That's a big number. 
Okay, and usually we're looking at about 0.05, um, somewhere around there for a acceptable number. But to get to that 10C rule, or to get to that 25 degrees C, if you look at these curves here, we've got 70 degrees C. It took us, or it took the lab doing this about three and a half hours at 70 degrees C to get to this 0.25. If we drop it down to 60 degrees top oil temperature, it extended it out to 70. And then they wrote it at 60 minus X, so 50 degrees C. It took them 14 hours to get to that 0.25 acid. So we call the 10 C rule for every 10 degrees C, we can reduce our top oil temperature. What are we doing? we're doubling that light, right? We've doubled the test result. Three and a half to seven to 14. That's just by dropping our top oil temperature if we can, by maybe fans, doing an infrared scan on the radiators. Have you ever done that and seen a radiator clogged or maybe not drilled all the way through? These are man-made products, are we perfect? Things can happen. So you've got to pay attention to that. That's why oil testing, infrared scanning is one of the best packages you can do on an energized transfer. Those times at the bottom were in hours? Yeah. Three and a, it took us three and a half hours at 95 degrees C to get to those temperatures. Or I'm sorry, to get to those, or I'm sorry, at the different temperatures. It took us three and a half hours at 70, at the top oil of 70 degrees C to get to a 0.25 acid. I didn't get that. Could you try again? No. No, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I hate about these watches. So, um, but it, what it does is, is the, the transformer heats up. It takes shorter periods of time to get to the acid number. Now that's the first test we look at to determine the aging process. We also look at an interfacial tension number and we also look at liquid power factor, not electrical testing power, but liquid power factor. And then we also look at inhibitor content. Um, inhibited oil is a great thing. We look at that by, you know, if we can keep the um, inhibitor the inhibitor is the first thing that gets used up by the amount of oxygen that's inside the transformer. It's an it reacts with that oxygen. If we can do oil maintenance on our transformer when the uh, um, inhibitor gets used up, but all of our test results are still acceptable, come in and do about five passes, maybe six passes, and then reinstate the inhibitor on the beginning of the last pass of the circulation, what we're doing is we're gonna polish up the oil real quick and then we're gonna reinstate the inhibitor. That gets mixed in with that oil and what it does is it protects the solid insulator or the paper in the transformer. Other catalysts. Um, we're gonna talk about moisture, low and high concentrations of moisture. Low concentration of moisture is 50, or I'm sorry, 10 part per million. High concentration is 50 part per million. So to get to this acid number, we have no other catalyst at the very top here except moisture. Low concentration, we got it out to about 3,500 hours. A little over that, we got it to a 0.17 acid. But then once we add higher concentration of moisture, that jumped up drastically, that acid number. Same amount of time. But that's not really a transformer. We have things inside our transformers that are catalysts that we can't do anything about. Iron, you have core steel, copper, or aluminum, one of the two, um, as your winding material. And there's nothing we can do about that. That's what's inside the transformer. That's how it's made. Now, during World War II, believe it or not, there were some silver-wound transformers, but the government got those back real fast after World War II. 
because they wanted their silver back. But if you look at, just take this bottom, the bottom ones, we have high concentration of moisture, 400 hours to get out to 8.10. Those are huge numbers when it comes to aging or acids on the transformer. Copper, 100, um, 100 hours, 11.2. So moisture is a huge catalyst also with this. You can see by these charts how fast or how much more uh, or how the increase of the acids are just by having some moisture in it. So moisture nowadays is a very simple thing. We can get rid of that very easily by dehydrating it, pulling vacuum on the transformer if it's rated for, tra or rated for vacuum. If it's not rated for vacuum, they have passive drying systems out there now that you can rent or buy. It's about the size of a refrigerator and you just plug it in right next to the transformer, plug it in, hook it up to the top and bottom valve, and you let it go. And it does circulations, but it's a very slow, long drawn out process. It can be upwards of a year, depending on how big the transformer is and how wet it is to dry it out. But the transformer doesn't have to go anywhere. It's still there, it's energized. So you're not losing any production or, or anything like that. The cellulose, it's a catalyst. So no matter what we do, that transformers are gonna age by the paper. It's going to attract the polar compounds that are in the oil. Paper is a polar compound. Ketones, metallic soaps, things that are generated inside the transformer or in the oil are also a polar compound. So they're attracted to each other. So the paper, it's going to act like a big filter. As you've seen the inside of a transformer, you know, you've got quite a bit of paper. That includes you know, the cardboard, the um, wood, anything like that that's inside the transformer is considered paper. So it absorbs all that into it. But it's an acid former, it's an absorbent, and it's also an adsorbent. It's going to put things into the oil as well as take it out of the oil. You wouldn't change the oil in your car without changing the oil filter, right? So there's countries out there that believe the best thing to do is to just drain the old oil out, put new oil in. Are we 100% positive that oil is going to be around forever? You know, I, we don't know. So let's recycle what we have. Let's reuse what we have by doing oil processing, oil maintenance on it. Now this one is kind of an interesting slide. Um, you got your neutralization number or your acid number, and then you got hours here. Let's look at this line number one right here, this dotted line. That's just oil, just oil, a sample of oil. And after so many hours, we started to see a very low increase in the acid number. Very slow process. But then if we look at line number two, that's just copper, just a copper strip tossed in the oil. So you can see right out of the gate that his acids started to increase. So what they did then was they took the oil sample, or an oil sample, took a piece of copper strip, wrapped paper around it, like what we have in our transformers, and tossed it in there. And we have this line three, oil plus paper wrapped copper wire. So what does that tell us? Where, does all, where did all those acids go? From line two, right into the paper. The paper is filtering it out. So those acids are going to start doing damage to that. Those ketones, metallic soaps, things like that. So what they're going to do is they're going to age, prematurely age that paper. That's why it's so important to do annual oil testing. Oil testing is probably one of the, or it is without a doubt, the cheapest thing you can do on an energized transformer. But then, uh, you know, what we do is if we have a bad gas test or whatever that might be, we might want to take the time to de-energize the transformer and do an electrical test on it. Isolate it and do an electrical test on it to confirm it. 
We're all about confirming. These, all these trip tests should trend. And if they don't, all of a sudden take a huge hit in something, let's retest it, let's verify it, because it's very easy to contaminate a sample <clears throat> on a transplant, pulling it on a sample. So how do you ensure you get a good sample? The standard ASTM D923 states that you should flush two liters of oil out of a transformer before you pull a sample. Now, that's a lot of oil out of a transformer that only has a couple hundred gallons in it. Now, I can justify that out of a big generator step up or something that's got 10,000 gallons in it. So, what they're inside the transformer, the valve on the transformer, whether it's a one inch or a two inch valve, you got a valve stem that goes back into the transformer about 10, 12 inches. We need to clean that pipe out because the oil in that pipe is stagnant. The oil in the transformer moves around. As it heats up, it, it expands or it goes up into the top, goes out into the radiator, starts to cool. It's called thermal siphoning. So what you want to do is you want to clean out that plug or that valve before it to get to the good representative oil in the transformer. That's probably, depending on the size of the valve, um, if it's a one inch plug, probably about 48 ounces, somewhere around there to get, because if you take a, like a plastic bottle that we use for filling up for an oil screen test, um, it's about a 12 ounce bottle, fill that up once, twice, dump it. You might want to fill it up a third time, so uh, somewhere around there, if it's a, um, Two inch valve, maybe do that four times. Okay. I can see how if the transformer is being loaded, you get all the, the eddy currents in the bubble mess everything up, mix everything up. But how representative is to say you, you you're doing your oil sampling at a low load time of the year and you haven't had as much oil movement? The only thing that's gonna really affect that is moisture. If you take it like in a, if you take a sample on it, say in the summertime, and then next year you do it in the winter, you might have a little bit of fluctuation on the moisture content because moisture moves around inside the transformer. You've got three locations. It can be in the paper, it can be in the oil, and it can be in the dead space or the head space above the oil, the vapor. So that might be a problem. What I would try to do if possible is pull your samples the best time to do an oil sample on a test is when it's, of course, heavily loaded. Summertime, July, August, something like that. Depending, of course, on where you're staying. You know, if it's you're in Arizona or something like that, then it's going to be whenever. Uh, it doesn't cool down much out there. Um, but yeah, the only thing that's really going to affect that much is moisture. Um, but we can still get good information off of all the other stuff that we do, all the other tests. So the oxygen content, what increases the oxi oxidation? Um, oxygen, of course, moisture, metals, electrical stresses, cellulose, the paper, high temperatures, and the presence of oxidation byproducts. But what do we do? Are there any of these that we can take care of in a transformer or an energized transformer? If we look at oxygen, yeah, we, all we have to do is go out and make sure that we don't develop a leak. Make sure that our nitrogen tanks or our conservator tanks, you know, continually have nitrogen or whatever, you're, or dry air, whatever you're using. There is a standard uh, for the nitrogen that you're using in transformers, ASTM D1933. Um, you don't want to just go to a welding shop or a gas, you know, air gas or wherever and say, I need a tank of nitrogen because they're going to give you welding grade nitrogen. It's cheap. And all that, but the standard says type one, type two, type three, nitrogen should be used, um, which is a very low grade. Type three is almost laboratory grade nitrogen, so it's a lot more expensive. But we don't want to pump moisture into our transformer. 
we can take, take care of that. We can take care of the moisture content. We can't do anything with the presence of metals, electrical stresses, or the paper that's inside the transformer. If we take care of these three things, oxygen, moisture, and heat, we're going to take care of that oxidation product. Here's the acid test, how it's done. Um, I'm not going to go through this too much with you. I don't have a lot of time left over. Uh, this is your interfacial tension number, which basically it's the interface between oil and distilled water. What we're doing is we're pulling this. It's looking for microscopic particles, um, things like that. But what we're doing is we're pulling the water up into the oil until that snaps. And that gives us our acid number, our interface between the two. The inhibitor content is kind of touched basis on that. Earlier, we've got 2.6 dichusherry butyl paracreosol. Most people just call it DVPC. And then there's also uh, butylated hydroxycholine. Um, the test that we can do, look for that in the oil test is, of course, the inhibitor content. And it will justify both of those numbers to. Uh, um, give us what the total inhibitor is. Standard says 0.3% per volume of oil. That's all you need in there. And it's going to extend the life or help us extend the life of the transformer. Um, inhibitor content measures the percentage of weight of the two, gives you the um, full number for both of them. Uh, if you look at a candy bar, if you stand next time you're standing in the grocery store line waiting to check out, look at a candy bar, you'll see that the candy bar actually has an inhibitor in it, an inhibitor in it. Uh, you know, like salad bars, things like that. So, you know, you need to have that stuff inhibited, usually with fruit and vegetables, things like that. It's uh, lemon juice, something along those lines. But if we keep inhibitor in our transformer, line A here is uninhibited oil. It took us to get to a 20 interfacial tension, which is a pretty good sized number. It took us about 150 hours on uninhibited oil. If we had about one tenth percent, it took us out to be so about 550 hours to get to this at a 95 degree C. But if we do what the standard tells us to do, and we keep the oxidation level at three tenths percent, we'll bring in that to get to that interfacial number, interfacial tension number of 20, almost 1,650 hours right around there somewhere. So that's a lot of time. So you might say, well, let's put 10%, bring it out here. You can put enough inhibitor into the tree. If you put too much inhibitor in the transformer, it can actually do damage to the transformer. The standard says three tenths percent, Let's just keep it at three tenths percent. And that can be done easily, oil process. Like I said, there are people that believe that just by taking the old oil out, putting new oil in, you're doing great. But all that stuff that's in your winding is eventually going to leach back out into the oil, and you're going to be right back where you started from. That's why we have to filter it. Run it through polar zero filtering system, heat, vacuum, things like that to get it taken care of. Keep the re-inhibitor. We want to keep the test results in acceptable levels except for the inhibitor content. This is the best time for you to do this maintenance because, believe it or not, it's going to be a cheaper time for you to do it. And you're going to extend the life of the transformer a lot more than what you do is if you wait until your test results go questionable and un unacceptable. And uh, because now we have to do more passes, so that increases your bill. And then um, we might have to do it, say, five years later instead of 10 years later on the re -inhibitor. Okay, thank you for coming. Uh, is there any questions? You got my business card. If you need, give me a call anytime if you think of something. Um, other than that, thank you.